Am I doing good? good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm uh, Dr. Jesse Myler. I'm at uh, American University now, where I'm an environmental toxicologist, and um, right now I'm working on microplastics. So that's how um, I'm connected to the Water Montgomery Green program and the work that you're doing. I worked with them last year on the project as well, and spoke to a couple classes then as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about microplastics, just a little background, but I'm going to focus mostly on environmental effects and health effects of microplastics. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing as it applies to microplastics, for examples. All right, so you probably already know this. I know that you've done a little bit of reading on microplastics, but just a reminder about why we care about these things. Plastics are long chain polymers. That means that they are, um, they're created by um, putting together lots of little um, components that make them really hard to break down, those long chain polymers versus short chain ones. Um, and they can, most of the plastics that we're talking about come from petroleum. They've been created by petroleum products. Some of them come from plants, but most of the ones we're talking about come from petroleum products. So a couple things to remember about them is that when the plastics are manufactured, sometimes things are added to them as well. Those additives sometimes can contain chemicals that actually are harmful to the environment and also to human health. And so I'm gonna to touch on those as well as the plastics themselves. Um, this is just showing the, the production of plastic as it is connected to human population. So as human population has grown over the past couple decades, so has plastic production. So we just have a lot of it out there, especially over the past like three decades. Um, just a review of the different kinds of plastics that, you know, like if you have a water bottle, you look at the bottom of it, you see a number on it, right? These are the most common ones, um, one to six, but then there's also a seventh category too, and that seventh category is kind of like the catch-all, all the other things that aren't listed up here. These are the most common ones that were produced at first, and then the newer ones that came out after that got stuck in the seventh category. Just as it relates to effects and environmental effects and, and potentially harmful effects for humans, number three, polyvinyl chloride, sometimes we just know it as vinyl, um, is one of them. And then number six, polystyrene, which is in styrofoam and other things like that. Um, and then number seven, because number seven con contains some kinds of plastics that are safer, but then also some kinds of plastics that are not as safe. All right, so what is microplastic? Again, this is probably a review for you guys, but um, mostly we're talking about plastics that are smaller than five millimeters in size. And that can contain all sorts of different kinds of plastics from fibers and filaments to little tiny spheres and microbeads um, and to actually things that are called nurdles because it's a fun word, so you know, might as well talk about nurdles. Nurdles are little tiny plastic pellets that are made, they're manufactured to actually be little pellets. And they are then put into giant shipping containers and shipped to places where they're actually gonna make other plastics out of them. So it's kind of like the starter component for bigger plastics. Make a plastic sled, plastic parts of cars, plastic water bottles, whatever it is, all different kinds of plastics. And they can be either like spherical or little cylinders, but tiny little pellets. So think of those giant shipping containers full of little tiny plastic nurdles. Right? What happens if that's being shipped across the ocean and something happens to it? It falls off the shipping, the, the, the ship itself ends up in the water. Those little nurdles can end up in um, marine ecosystems, right? We don't see nurdles too much in the places where you guys are going to be looking because we're not really manufacturing nurdles around here. So they're not likely to be seen in the waterways. But some of the ones that you might see are these fibers and then these fragments, these tiny little pieces of plastic that started out as a bigger type of plastic, plastic bag, plastic water bottle, fleece, that then kind of break down into smaller pieces and end up in the environment. All right, so to go over some of the plastic effects, there's, it actually says over 220 species of different kinds of animals have been shown to have ingested microplastics. That's actually, it's even more. It's about 260 species now. That includes everything from fish and turtles and invertebrates to birds and even humans. So we know that humans have actually ingested plastic as well. Um, 
by mostly by looking at what comes out of us. <laughs> yep. So, um, but also thinking about why we care. Why would we care about plastics in our bodies or in the bodies of other organisms? Any ideas? Yeah. It doesn't break down. Yeah. So plastic, most of the time, is actually going to move through our system. It's not going to stick around. It might get caught up in the GI tract, in the gastrointestinal tract for a little while, but it's probably going to move through eventually. Any other reasons why we might care about the plastics that go into organisms? Yeah. Say it a little bit louder. Like result in a cause of death, maybe? Or like yeah. Because of the components they have? Like That's poison? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the plastics might actually contain things that are harmful to the organism. That might be things that are added onto the plastic, like I mentioned before, those additives, like bisphenol A or phthalates, other things that are actually part of the, the plastic manufacturing process. But the other thing about plastics is that they're a really good substrate or surface for other things to kind of get fixed onto. Some of those things can be chemicals, like you just mentioned, and some of those things can be pathogens or harmful bacteria. So the organisms, including us, if we're ingesting these things, it could be a problem, right? Um, so some of the organisms that we know have been ingesting them are um, oysters, mussels, and other filter feeders, things that are filtering the water, and they're not really looking for plastics, right? They're not being discriminating about what they're taking in. Taking in everything, looking for plankton, trying to eat whatever's in the water. But what happens if they take in a whole lot of plastic? It can fill up their GI tract, which means they're not gonna have room for the food that they need. And they can die of starvation because of that if it fills up their systems, fish as well. That can happen with macroplastics too, the bigger plastics, like plastic bags before they break down or plastic bottle caps, right? Um, we've seen a number of seabirds especially. Most of the work on macroplastics has actually been done on seabirds, mostly dead seabirds that have been looked at after they have washed up on shores and things. Albatross, fulmars, other kinds of um, seabirds. Okay. And then you mentioned some of the things that kind of, they could be um, toxic on the plastics. Some examples of those, has anyone heard of um, PCBs before? So PCBs are polychlorinated biphenols. They're not made anymore. However, they're one of those chemicals that sticks around in the environment for a really long time. We outlawed the use of PCBs in the 70s, but we still find them in the Anacostia. They're still there, they're in the sediments, they're sticking around for a long time. So the reason that we care about them as far as plastics go is that they can actually fix themselves onto the surface of the plastic. The other reason that we care is that they're toxic. They're really nasty things. They can actually cause cancer. They're carcinogenic. So we care about them for that reason. Some of the other things that can um, be a problem, I mentioned phthalates. That's that funny word here that begins with a P-H-T-H, phthalates. And um, bisphenol A, or BPA. Has anyone heard of bisphenol A before? Sometimes when you go to buy a, a, like a water bottle, a reusable water bottle, it'll say BPA free on it. That's what it means. It means there's no bisphenol A in it. Bisphenol A and phthalates are both known as what's called endocrine disruptors. And those are chemicals that can kind of mess up the hormone system in animals. Oysters, fish, and humans too. So by messing up the hormone systems, it can affect reproduction, can affect development, can even affect like immune system functions and stuff. So we care about these things. Um, all right, let's go. And then you also give me like a five minute time. Okay, or two minute time, it's not that short. Sure. All right, so I was just gonna mention a couple of, um, of the projects that I work on right now. So that's kind of the background on microplastics and why we care. One of the projects I work on at American with my undergraduates is microplastics in the Anacostia, and we've been working on um, some sites that are tributaries to the Anacostia, kind of like you guys. We're just a little bit further down in tidal zones in DC. Um, but we've been looking for microplastics there. We found them in the water and in the sediment. We've also looked in Rock Creek Park in DC, and we've looked at um, sediment and water samples in the Potomac River. We found them in all places. The most common place was actually near Bladensburg in the upper part of the Anacostia. 
um, but that was in the main stem of the Anacostia. So everything that washes down from the branches that you guys are looking at is going to end up in the main stem of um, the Anacostia. So it matters, it's all connected, right? Um, most of what we saw was, like I mentioned, in the Anacostia over the Potomac, and also we saw different kinds of plastic in the water column compared to the sediment. Why would you see different kinds of plastic in the water column compared to the sediment? Saw them in both places, but different types. Any ideas why? Has something to do with what type of plastic it is. Nurdles. So nurdles are a good example of something that is more dense. We would see nurdles probably in the sediment because they're more dense. They're going to settle out of the water. The things that are lighter, less dense, they're going to float. Okay, so we'll see them in the water column. And that might be what you guys are seeing in filaments and lighter things as well in your water. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then another uh, project that I was working on is on looking at catfish brown bullhead in the Anacostia and in the Potomac and looking in their GI tracts to see if there were any microplastics. I took 30 fish from the up near Bladensburg, 30 fish down by um, closer to the mouth of the Anacostia and then 30 fish from the Potomac near Dyke Marsh. And um, this was part of another project so I wasn't using the fish just for this. They were already looking at the fish for something else and so I just kind of attached myself to the project to use more of the fish that was already going to be used. So, um, but we found microplastics in about 8% of the samples overall, but the most of them were seen up near Bladensburg. Um, the least amount were seen in the Potomac. So it might have to do with the volume of water. It might also have to do with the, these guys are bottom feeders, and what they're eating on the bottom of the Anacostia is a little bit different than what they're eating in the bottom of the Potomac, um, at least where we sampled. And then the third project that I've been working on is up in the Patapsco River in Baltimore Harbor. And um, we're looking at what's called a biofilm. We put a disc out in the water, lower it down, leave it out there for a long time. Any surface that water flows over grows stuff. That's a biofilm. It grows stuff, usually starts out as like bacteria and other little microorganisms. And then it builds up this matrix and other stuff grows on top of it. And eventually you have this like whole little community of cool stuff barnacles, mussels, all sorts of stuff growing on there. I was really curious to see if microplastics were gonna get caught up in that biofilm, and they were. So, um, go ahead, thanks. So these are some of the pictures of the organisms that were on the biofilm. There's some crabs, some mudworms, um, different kinds of algae, and then we also saw microplastics. Mostly fibers, some styrofoam, and some microbeads as well. Um, yeah, these are more pictures of them. And then this is a picture of a mudworm burrow. So mudworms actually make these little tiny like tubes to hide in. And we found that micro, they were using microplastics to actually weave into their burrows, which is really interesting. So it's not just inside some of the bigger organisms, but it's actually in the habitats of the organisms themselves. These are some uh, microbeads. And then just to say, there's a whole lot of research that's being done on microplastics right now as it relates to organisms in the environment, but then also as it relates to um, just presence in like uh, waterways and sediment. So organisms, sediment, waters, but not as much on human health. So most of what we know about microplastics in humans is that it's in some of our food sources. It's in some of the fish and um, marine organisms that we might eat, the commercial kinds like anchovies and um, lobsters and mussels and things like that, but it's also in salt, and it's also been found in drinking water, bottled water and tap water. So why we care about this is because the same reasons that we cared about it for the other organisms. We're all connected, and a lot of the internal systems of those other organisms, like the fish and the mussels and things, the taxa groups, the organ, the organ systems in those different taxa groups is conserved. So we actually have similar systems, not exactly the same, but similar systems, similar endocrine systems, similar reproductive systems in the organisms. And so that's why we care. Um, <clears throat> some of the, the chemicals that I mentioned before, um, like phthalates or bisphenol A, have been shown to have reproductive and developmental effects on humans. 
These are in large quantities, so probably if we're ingesting microplastics, we're not talking about those concentrations, at least not for humans. Probably we would see those effects on organisms that are taking in higher concentrations, the ones that are filtering the water and taking in a lot of it, right? But probably not in humans, at least not yet. And then just in general, there needs to be a lot more work done with humans. We don't know enough about the effects on humans. So I would say those are kind of like the next questions for microplastics work, is looking for human effects, and then also what happens when, you know, we start out with these plastic bags, right? Or something else, some other kind of macro plastic, big plastic. And in the environment, it breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. Does anyone know why? Why it breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces? Yeah. So yeah, it depends on definitely how durable it is, right? So like a Nalgene bottle is gonna take a really long time to break up in the environment. But a plastic bag, like one of the filmy grocery bags or something, it's gonna break up really quickly. But it's not gonna go away. So it has to do with how thick it is, how durable it is. But it also has to do with the environment itself. Is it being tossed around in the waves a lot? Is it being banged up against rocks? Is the sun shining on it? So those physical processes and the chemical processes can break it up quickly, yeah. But the grocery bags, do you put them in the trash or like put them in the trash or something? So grocery bags, yes. Um, you don't want to put them in the trash if possible. Most grocery stores have a take back container where you can put your grocery bags. And there are special recycling facilities that can take plastic bags. Most of the ones that we recycle at for Montgomery County or for DC can't take plastic bags. But most of, but they can they can send them to a special recycling facility. The reason they can't go to the recycling facility where we can put plastic bottles is because they get they gum up the machines. They end up going into the machine and they clog it up, and then you can't recycle the other stuff. So we want to make sure that they go to the special plastic bag recycling facility. Good question. All right. Um, so I'll stop there and I'll answer any questions. You can ask me questions about whatever. It doesn't have to be about microplastics too, but anything you want. That's a great question. It has to do with the volume that they take in. Um, if they if they're just taking in little bits, like the brown bullheads that I was looking at, most of them were passing it through. Um, the organisms that are taking in larger amounts, like the ones that are filter feeding, the, um, taking in a whole lot of water volume, and they, therefore they can take in a lot more microplastics, that can get caught up in their system. Almost like it's filling up their GI system. They think that they're full, so they're not actually going to eat, so they can starve because of that. Or it can actually clog up their system, and then it, meaning like, think about a stomach and there's a little hole that comes into it and a little hole that comes out of it, it can actually stop it up so that nothing can make it through and so they could die because of that too. Um, it's a little bit different for larger organisms because microplastics are so small. Most of them are gonna move through our systems. But um, birds that eat bigger plastics, that's the, it's the same kind of idea. If, they're, if it fills up their GI system, then they're not gonna be able to eat other things, right? Yeah, great question. Yeah. Does it cost money for the stores to recycle your plastic bags? Yes, um, yeah, but there are programs that actually subsidize it, that yeah. have to pay for it. Yeah, um, it's a shame that they're not all in the same recycling facility. Uh, it would be a lot cheaper if that was the case. <laughs> yeah, it used to be, but the systems are not able to handle it right now. Hopefully they get to that point again, it will be cheaper to them all the same place. Yeah, other questions? Did you guys get to go out in the field? Yeah, what was your experience doing sampling in the field? <laughs> like what? Like I saw glass, mm -hmm. and some water bottles, and like uh, maybe wrap of Skittles. So wrappers are tricky. Skittles wrappers or potato chip wrapper <coughs> bags or whatever. Those kinds of things are made of composite materials. And also glass bottles. Yeah. Well, glass bottles. See, the thing about glass bottles is we can recycle them almost indefinitely. You send them to the recycling facility, they'll just melt them down, make another glass thing out of them. Plastic, every time you recycle plastic, it kind of degrades into a lesser and lesser quality of plastic. So at some point, we're not going to be able to use it for anything except for those composite materials. 
like the chip bags and the Skittle wrappers and stuff like that. Those composite materials though aren't recyclable because they're doing this hodgepodge thing of like combining metal and plastic together or paper and plastic together. And so you can't break them down to recycle them easily. So that's kind of like an end of the line um, for that kind of plastic, which is a shame because it's not going back into the system to be used for something else, right? It's kind of, you're stopping using that resource. Yeah? You mentioned that they're not recyclable, but some uh, places do accept them for recycling and they can be made into like right. TerraCycle. Has yes, TerraCycle. Is awesome. I'm a super ambassador and that's actually one of the things that we talk about is this, how TerraCycle recycles them into like little craft beads yes. and things like that. So you can make other things into them, but you can't necessarily turn them back into another kind of plastic. Yeah. Um, because it's hard to separate those composite materials. But yeah, good point. No, I mean, TerraCycle does amazing things in keeping things out of the landfill. Yeah, really great. Or from being incinerated or something. Nice. Any other questions? Okay. It was awesome. It was nice meeting with you guys. Thank you for having me.